The Constitution, which we have come to deify as part of our American narrative, is a piece of paper. It is a means to an end. It is an instrument. It is not holy writ. It did not descend from heaven to the whole, via the Holy Ghost carrying his beak and brought to Philadelphia. It's not what happened. The founding fathers were not the apostles. No. We think they were. We are taught they were. And, well, do any of you older folks ever read a book called America's History Lands, National Geographic? I gave it to my brother for his birthday three days ago. It's a great book. And actually, it's a beautiful book. Wonderful photography. But it gives us the story of America as I was taught it. A, a nation conceived in liberty that went through, like the dialectic through, wrong terminology, sorry, that went through in ever burgeoning circles of freedom, through abolitionism, the Civil War, the industrial rights movement, the growth of invention and technology, the conquest of the West, the voluntary relinqu relinquishment of the West by the Indians. <laughs> Isn't that what happened? <laughs> anyway, uh, and so it went until it produced the wonderful space age, which we here in 1962 are happy to live in. Well, every nostalgia for a lost age of Republican perfection, Republican with a small r, has been an unending element of American conservatism. But the word was not really used in this country much before the American Civil War. The ideologies, however, were already lining up. In the North, in New England, where, as we know, all perfection comes. <laughs> Serious thinking was being done. People like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who had been a Unitarian minister and left it because it was too dogmatic. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau, who was able to sit at Walden Pond and think deep thoughts because his grandmother paid his bills. <laughs> I told my grandmother when I found that out, I said, Nana, you know, if you paid all my bills and gave me a hefty allowance, I could think deep thoughts like Henry David Thoreau. And she said, grandson, if you were capable of thinking deep thoughts like Henry David Thoreau, I would pay all your bills. <laughs> so at any rate, these were the folks that actually gave us a good chunk of our American ideology that we have today, that all Americans to some degree are affected by. Conduct over creed. It doesn't matter what you believe so long as you're a nice person. I think we've all heard that somewhere. Um, the, the inevitability of progress, wandering through the world like the dialectic. All right. I keep on mentioning the dialectic, but I'm only being half funny because the fact is it's not, and this is a mistake a lot of people make, it's not that this vision of progress we have is Marxist, but it is akin to it. It is cognate to it. It's not the same thing. It's not identical. Ralph Waldo Emerson didn't get smashed at the old oyster house with Karl Marx. It, it wasn't like that. But similar first principles bring similar results. You see, that's just the way it is. And this is why, on one level, America has always favored overseas progressive causes. And even when we've because they were, say, in, in later years, communist, we were fighting with one hand behind our back because there was a certain deep sympathy we couldn't get away from. But we'll get there. So that's what was happening in the North. And in the South, in the Middle States, they were doing something entirely different in the period before the war, the Civil War. They were reading romances. Yep, Sir Walter Scott. And they weren't just reading them, they were writing them. Washington Irving, there's a guy for you. Sanest man in the States in those days. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, maybe not so sane. And of course up north, the, the exception that proved the rule was the inimitable Nathaniel Hawthorne, 
who uh, knew all the transcendentalists, but broke with them because he found them completely unrealistic. He's also he spent time with them at Brook Farm. If you ever really want to know how people are, live with them in a commune. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn. So anyway, the, uh, the period before the Civil War culminated in a certain sense in those three authors, all of whom might claim to be conservative, though again, the word wasn't used. The closest either any of the three came was Nathaniel Hawthorne in writing uh, The Old Tory, if you ever read that. He, too, he gets very loyalist friendly. Washington Irving, of course, uh, this, the whole nostalgia thing that he evoked so well. It was a conservative impulse. Edgar Allan Poe was probably the most professedly, politically conservative of the three. If you ever read his uh, wonderful work, Some Words with a Mummy, uh, not a mommy, a mummy, you know, the wrapped up Egyptian dead thing. Um, a reanimated Egyptian corpse uh, declares that his country was overthrown and destroyed by a terrible despot. And when asked the name of the despot, he said that he thought its name was Mob. So that was where conservatism was before the war between the states, a fear of mob rule. And Andrew Jackson uh, was very much a Bonaparte-like figure. And like Bonaparte, was he conservative, was he liberal? And like Bonaparte, that doesn't mean anything. There are elements of him. You could say he was conservative. Uh, he, um, I've often thought of this with regard to Roe v. Wade when uh, he decided he wanted to deport the five civilized tribes of Indians from the south. They, being civilized, went to court. Uh, 